So as we wrote our book, Age of Context, we started seeing just how deeply uh, data is changing nearly everything from railroads to you know, uh, consumer internet app companies. And here I have a, a venture capitalist from Claremont Creek who is going to tell us about uh, how it's changing health. And who are you? I'm Ted Driscoll. I'm a partner at Claremont Creek Ventures. I run the healthcare side of our business, and we're trying to capture the value created by this revolution that's happening in healthcare right now. Yeah. And then, so, how do you look at the healthcare, the health market? Because on, on one level, we're seeing lots of little wearable things like uh, Fitbits mm -hmm. and fuel bands and all that. And on another level, we're seeing uh, all sorts of genomic stuff sure. happening, sure. like uh, 23andMe got sure. in trouble with the FDA. We could talk sure, about that. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, we focus on where the doctor's decision-making is being changed in healthcare. So in other words, I don't focus so much on how a consumer is being informed about their, their health. They can do that themselves. I'm focused on how does a doctor's decision-making get changed. So. How does he do a better job of diagnosing cancer and finding the exact treatment that will work for you and not someone else? Or how is the uh, pregnant woman's baby going to be developing and whether it's going to develop normally or have genetic uh, variations in it of some sort or another? Or what drug is the right one for a patient who's depressed? We, we invest in companies that have changed medical decision making. Tell me about your background. Sure. Who are you? <laughs> and, and how do you get well, to I started have out in this valley as a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I'm basically trained in medical imaging and image processing and pixel pro pushing effectively. Uh, I started out in satellite imaging and then fingerprint imaging and then moved into medical imaging in the 1980s. Uh, five different startups. Uh, the, one of them was, for example, running the group that developed the first MRI scanners at Diasonics. So I, I was uh, in charge of that technical team. Wow. And uh, uh, it, that frankly was the first area where big data was coming into medicine because all of a sudden instead of a piece of film that was an x-ray, we were giving them 256 slices of digital data of somebody's body or something. So as a consequence, suddenly doctors had to deal with megabytes, gigabytes of information. And that was important to the uh, medical field at that time. It was, yeah. was eye-opening to the medical field at that time. I got into the venture capital business about a decade ago and I've been investing in digital health startups because I think that's one of the most interesting places that, that IT is affecting our lives. Give me a sense of what's, it, 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 you know, the layperson who's watching mm -hmm. probably doesn't know what's changing in health and, and what you're trying to sure. build it sure. as an investor. 25 years ago, 50 years ago, we were measuring simple things like pulse rate or you know your temperature or something like that blood pressure basic, basic numbers yeah okay today we now have available to us three billion base pairs of genetic information and there's epigenetic information on top of that and there's proteomics that are floating around in our blood hundreds of thousands what's proteomics just different proteins that are proteins. floating around in our blood that are that are made by those genes effectively and they're different you and i are different we may be only 1% different, but since our genome contains 3 billion base pairs, that means we have 30 million differences between us, wow. okay, if we're 1% difference. So that means that medicine is really becoming personalized. It's becoming what works for you. And what works for you may not work for me. It may completely have no effect for me, okay? So that's what we're interested in is the personalization of medicine that's coming from this big data revolution. Doctors are dealing now not with tens of bytes of information, but with tens of terabytes of information. And so we're trying to find the ways to make medicine better using that data. So the, the medical world is really uh, going through some shifts. I mean, I, my doctor still uses mostly paper to mm -hmm. keep track of my chart, you know. Mm -hmm. um, are you making investments at that infrastructure level? Like I'm e not so e interested in the bookkeeping and administration in healthcare. Mm -hmm. That other people are doing that. The electronic health records. Yes, and electronic health records. I'm very interested in electronic health records for what I can draw from them. Okay, and I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. Um, but uh, I'm more interested in specifically changing a doctor's decision about a patient. He should get this drug and not that drug, for example. So okay. give me a sense of what's happening in that world. I, uh, we now have a, a 
a genome map, right? Yeah, and, we, and we can do that fairly cheaply, right? It's now, the, in fact, Illumina just in a recent conference announced that it's now below $1,000 for them to do, generate a complete genome, okay? Uh, they have a device that can do that. I won't invest in a company that does that raw data collection. I invest in companies that use that data to make smarter medical decisions. Yeah. Okay, so in fact, many of my companies do use the hardware made by those companies. But a thousand dollars is still uh, to the place where I probably won't invest in it myself. Right? Correct. But it was it was a uh, hundred million dollars ten years ago. Okay, yeah. it's dropping far faster than Moore's law. If it's a thousand dollars this year, it'll be a hundred dollars in two years. I mean, it's rapidly dropping. And remember, your genome isn't changing very much. Okay, so basically, once it's done, it can be used again. Actually, that's one of the things that I find very interesting about what's happening in medicine right now. We have an investment in a non-invasive prenatal testing company named Natera. I can't talk too much about it because of SEC regulations, but it tests a fetus to find out whether it has genetic abnormalities or not. I personally believe that 20 years from now, all babies will be tested and their electronic medical record will get pre-populated with their genetic information. So when wow. the baby is delivered and the pediatrician takes the baby over, he already knows what drug that patient, that uh, baby will respond to, or whether he'll be prone to uh, ear infections or allergies or something like that. So I think that genetics, non-invasive prenatal testing, will become the entrance ramp to the electronic medical record and to better medicine as we we learn the personalization of that baby as they're born. Wow. Tell me the difference between doing a full genome and what 23andMe does. Uh, they, as I said, you, you know, I, I've done that now for 23andMe and for Ancestry.com. Sure, you spit in a little sure, tube. Sure, and sure. I send did away I've your done spit. It. My whole family's done it. Um, at first, the way genetics is coming is they're looking at the places where people vary naturally, very often. Okay, and so the things that make my eyes green is that a blue, for example, that's a something called a SNP. A single nucleotide polymorphism this is the technical term for it. It means that one base pair is different. Okay, I have three billion base pairs in my genome. Frankly, if a, a number of them are different, I wouldn't even live. I'd be dead. Okay, yeah. but there are certain areas where variation can happen that can cause me to be tall and thin. You know, and you to not be as tall as me, or something like I that. I thought that was eating in and out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The fact is. Uh, my genome is different than yours, yeah. but it's, it's different in predictable places. And that's what three, uh, 23andMe looks at. They don't look at the whole three billion base pairs. They look at approximately a million locations where variation in humanity is common. And that's, okay. and that's why they can do it for less than a couple right. hundred dollars. Right, they use a right? chip that just looks for specific areas. It's something you could refer to as targeted sequencing. They're only looking at certain areas where they know variation makes a difference. Of those three billion base pairs, how, how much do we really know about, about the genome and what it does? Uh, how, much is mapped, you, how much I, is mapped? I have some science friends who will not appreciate this, but I honestly believe we are just scratching the surface and figuring it out. Like we, 1% or something? Yeah, I, I think we, well, um, the, the problem is the genome, it isn't just simply the genome. There's something called the epigenome that lays on top of the genome, which causes certain genes to be potentiated or inhibited. Um, there are variations in our immune system and our T cells that are different based on the diseases we faced when we were children, for example. So it isn't just simply that. There's also all this other data that's floating around as well on top of it that is causing it to be different one way or the other. I don't think we understand more than one or two percent in the end wow. of all of that stuff. On the other hand, we are for the first time reading the instruction book. Before, we were just sort of inferring it. Oh, he's hot. He must have a fever. You know, oh, his temperature is at 99 instead of 98. He must be maybe fighting an infection or something. We were inferring things. Now we're actually looking at the instruction code. We're looking at the, the things that make you different than me and make you respond differently to certain things. Okay, so I, I, I think we're at the threshold of a huge revolution in medicine. We're, we're in a renaissance, effectively, where we're actually looking at the molecular mechanisms of disease and treating them specifically uniquely for you or me. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating time. So what kinds of companies are, do you think are going to be built in the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. You know, if you were writing a book on the next 10 years of health, what, what would it say? I think what we're going to find is that certain areas that used to be kind of random choice, like, for example, okay, I'm pregnant, we'll just have to see what baby comes out, okay, and whether they're normal or not. Um, we're moving toward a time where we will know very specifically what that baby is. That's what Natera does. 
We have another company called Assurex that basically determines whether you will respond or not respond to classes of drugs like pain relievers or antidepressants. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure you know much about that field, but in, the, in that field, psychiatrists will prescribe an antidepressant to some patients, and frankly, 30, 40, 50 percent of the patients don't even respond to the drug, and after six weeks, they try a different one. Yeah. Okay, it's been trial and error for a long time. These guys have found the genetic yeah. markers. My dad, my dad went through that, and then, yeah, they, it took several trial and errors before they found stuff that, that exactly. made him happy. And They've now found from a simple cheek swab what genetic markers there that you have in that cheek swab that will t say you will respond well to Prozac, you will not respond to Celexa, for example, in the depression field. And so as a consequence, and they've already done published papers now that show that it works. It absolutely does work. So that they're taking the trial and error out. You, you that reduces cost in the healthcare system. Dramatic right? cost. In fact, they've actually got a paper published on the subject that says that for a $1,200 test, they save a company uh, $5,000 a year in insurance costs for reimbursing drugs that don't work effectively. Uh, wow. so, so that's the kind of thing we're investing in. We're investing in early stage cancer diagnostics, trying to catch cancer before it's metastatic. Yeah. There have been a lot of investments in the past on, on people who are looking for cancer cells floating around in the blood, but that's almost too late because that means the disease has already metastasized, okay, and it's already spreading. So SRI, SRI showed me one of those sensors that mm -hmm. can see a, a cell of um, a pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. in, a, in uh, billions of blood cells. Well, right? One of the things we're learning now is that when these, these cells become cancerous, they start producing different proteins that are floating around in the blood before they become metastatic. And if we can see those proteins, we can tell you have pancreatic cancer before it starts to spread. Okay, so we can deal with it earlier. I mean, if you know much yeah. about pancreatic cancer, it's diagnosed really late. Okay, normally it's already metastasized when people figure out what the major weight Metastasized means it's spread. It's spread, okay. Yeah. Um, so what we're trying to do is start to try to find, in effect, sniff it out before it started to spread, okay? And uh, wow. that's the kind of investment we're interested in, is, which again will lower costs. If we can catch cancer earlier, we can cure the patient with a much smaller, simpler pre, uh, procedure or a much lower dose of a medicine. So in the end, almost everything we do should lower costs. But what right, we're trying to do right now is do the best thing for medicine. Does, does that uh, mean our life expectancy is going up? I would ex expect it does. And, and I, I think some of our uh, life expectancy is determined by our genes. In other words, I don't think we'll suddenly start living to be 200, okay? I, I think that's not likely unless we make some major genetic modifications. Frankly, I think if, if people lived forever, then we wouldn't have much evolution because you need survival of the fittest, and so you need some um, you know, turnover of the population. But on the other hand, I think what will happen is more and more people will live to the maximum life expectancy, which is probably in the, roughly around 100 or something like that. Um, and uh, there will be fewer people who die at 30 and 40 because we will have caught those diseases early and given them a normal lifespan. Yeah. Are you doing anything with brain research or are you totally focused on other We are doing things with brain research and, and, and I will say there is an area where I'm not even sure we understand 1%. Okay, I think we understand even less than that. What makes my brain actually work? I mean, there are neurologists who will tell you they know all about this firing and that firing and these connections and those connections. But the fact is the brain is still kind of a mystery. Yeah. Uh, and um, I just remember uh, meeting some brain scientists who use MRI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to um, put a probe into uh, somebody who has uh, Parkinson's yes, and their hands are shaking like this. And, and they, they can zap one little tiny area and yeah. uh, they can stop it. Yeah, that, we're getting good at that kind of thing, okay? But, but on the other hand, they can't from an MRI tell what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. Okay, they can maybe generally say I'm thinking about somebody I love or somebody I hate, but they can't, uh, they can't think specifically about what I'm, see exactly what I'm thinking about. And then if you think about it, the brain uh, which has been this isolated piece of meat inside my head for since I was a caveman is suddenly now being connected to things like Google Glass and my iPhone and, and things like that. I'm being connected to the bigger world and that man-machine interface I think is a fascinating area. Yeah. Okay? Uh, how are we going to basically take the internet and run it through my optical fibers and my, my, my optical ne uh, nerve in effect and get that information into my brain? so that my brain benefits from it. So I think that's a fascinating area. That yeah, I, I think that's the part of singularity I, I like. I, the life expectancy stuff, I, I'm like, I, I'm with you. I yeah. think we need uh, 
death death clears out the uh, we need the field. Over. We need turnover. Yeah, it's like plowing a field. You need to plow a field for new flowers to bloom, right? Yes, exactly. you know, if you keep the old exactly. flowers around, the new exactly. ones don't bloom. Well, think about it. If we did live to 300 or 400 years, uh, I'm not sure people are going to work at the age of 250. So we're going to end up with an entire retirement community with just a few tiny percent of the people. It's to a certain extent what the country of Japan is going through right now with an elderly population, not enough of people working. So. There are all kinds of serious uh, socio-demographic demographic effects that are going to happen if we do extend life expectancy much longer. Yeah. And so I think we, I don't want to, I, I just want to make us healthier yeah. you know, that, through that whole process, not going through this long decline of diabetes and obesity and all kinds of other things that make us healthier. Um. What else do you, are you seeing as part of a venture capital group? You know, well, what? one of the things that's interesting is if you know much about the publication business in medicine, there are all these special journals, the Journal of Neurology, the Journal of Cardiology, and things like that. And one of the interesting things there is that they use this like 300-year-old model. I submit a paper to a peer-reviewed group who decides whether this is good or not. It takes like six months to get published. And then the library gets charged $1,500 a year to get a subscription to the magazine. And, it's kind of this ancient process, you know. So we actually made a small seed investment in a company called Curus that, that uh, is in effect using Yelp-like techniques for, for scientific papers. Everybody can submit, and then when someone likes the paper, you, the, the best papers tend to rise to the top, yeah. okay? And so it's, it's, it's a new way, in effect, of, of uh, publishing medical information. I'm very interested in the idea that the doctors in Podunk, you know, Alabama, are getting the most recent medical information, are not just using 20-year-old information to treat their patients. So I'm also interested in that flow of medical decision-making information, and that's one of the reasons we made that investment. Um, Where, what role does government have to play in this? You know, uh, FDA is uh, it's already uh, getting involved in 23andMe, sure. and I, I know uh, some entrepreneurs who are building sensor companies, and they're like. Wow, the, the government regulation is really a hard thing to get through, you know, because you have to do so much sure. work to prove that your device Well, is when the FDA was created, we were dealing with issues like thalidomide, drugs that we didn't really know how they worked. We didn't know the molecular mechanisms they got involved with. And there were these sudden, unexpected, serious side effects. So we became very cautious with the FDA in terms of trying to make sure you went through very exhaustive studies before we released these things to the public. But things are moving so fast right now and they're becoming so personalized that I think the FDA is having a tough time drawing the line now as, it, as the world expands out. Where is the place where they need to you know, say, this is something we need to regulate and this is something we don't? Yeah. I, I confess, I was somewhat offended by the FDA when they said to me that I was not allowed to see my own genome effectively. Here, I give a sample to 23andMe. They give me back some very carefully researched papers and information about what's in my genome. And then all of a sudden the FDA says, you're not allowed to see your own genome uh, yeah. until we get regulated, regulatory approval or something. I think that's kind of a little odd, okay? And I'm not particularly in favor of it. Um, on the other hand, I do understand that you can't have every single person who gets a BRCA1 mutation immediately go out and have you know, uh, major surgery done okay, panic and have major surgery done just because Angelina Jolie did, okay? Yep. Uh, so I do understand that it has to be done somewhat carefully that, and that the population needs to be informed and make measured decisions and a doctor should be somehow involved. But I think we're entering a world where even the doctors are having some difficulty keeping track of all the information that's being created. You know, Kevin Serace, who is here, is mm -hmm. investing in a sensor company you're going to put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things it can tell you is you're going to have a heart attack in the next 24 hours, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a medical device. Yeah. That's, that's doing the job of what a doctor used to do. Well, the fact is, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm to a certain extent mystified as to why the FDA would prevent that from coming to market. Isn't it? Sounds like good information. Okay. I don't know that they would prevent it, but they they make it take a long time and spend a lot of money to come yeah. to market. Yes, because you have to do a big, long clinical trial. I have companies like that. One of the interesting areas that I'm, I'm fascinated. We have a company right, right now which is actually engineering um, viruses to do things for humans, as opposed to. Um, in fact, that sounds really scary. <laughs> well, for example, I'm not sure you're familiar with it, but a lot of patients who are admitted to hospitals are carrying something called methicillin-resistant staph aureus, MRSA. Okay, it's a hospital-acquired infection. 
Wow. Okay, it's, it, it's sometimes referred to, it's similar to something called flesh-eating bacteria, okay? Yeah. And so if you have an incision, it will eat you. It will eat into it and it cause a major problem that can kill you effectively. Well, pa patients, some patients, particularly patients coming from nursing homes or from animal husbandry facilities, um, are colonized in their nasal passages with this bacteria, okay? And so hospitals have been testing that by taking a nasal swab and then testing in culture media and finding out 24 hours later, did something bad grow in that culture media? And if it did, we have to isolate this patient and use gown and glove and stick, you know, lock doors on their hotel room so they don't spread to everyone else. Well, what's interesting is the bacteria that causes that particular disease has its own viruses. Not viruses that affect you and me, but viruses that only affect it, okay? And what wow. we found, we invested in a startup that is taking that virus and changing it so instead of um, reproducing inside the bacterium that's causing the disease, it lights up, okay? So you can tell whether the patient has this bacterial colonization or not very, very quickly and cheaply. Um, so in effect, we're starting to, we're moving from reading the DNA to starting to write it to a certain extent, to starting to write it so that it helps us in doing things. And we made an investment in one company that does that. This, okay. this gets into science fiction. I, I just interviewed the uh, 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 writer for Helix, mm -hmm. and uh, that's an R&D lab up in, you know, up by the North Pole. <laughs> that goes completely nuts, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do, does Frankly, I think 100 years from now, we'll be talking about that, because I think a lot of what we see as life on this planet in 100 years will be engineered life. It'll be things that we have created, because we've figured out DNA enough to begin to modify it a little bit. We're already doing it to a certain extent. We're wow. producing you know, grains that produce vitamin A so we can reduce vitamin A deficiency in, in underprivileged populations. Um, we're already doing it, but we're using it kind of the old fashioned way. It's like crossing two strains to do it. We're rapidly moving toward a stage where we can actually almost you know, program. program it in effect. And if you think about it, DNA is really computer code. It's just computer code, biological computer code, as opposed to you know, bits and bytes. It's base pairs, but it's basically information encoded in a DNA helix. And that's what all of life on this planet is about. Okay, so I think we're gonna start writing our own code as well as just reading it and figuring out what it means. Well, that's a big idea. That, that deserves its own TED talk right there. <laughs> oh, I'm, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who are talking about that because I just read a science fiction story actually my daughter recommended to me that I thought was very interesting about sort of a dystopian world where that went out of control. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that there are some major challenges in front of us in the next hundred years in terms of ethical issues and safety issues and, and whatever we have to watch out for. Um, wow. So, but you, but you, you are certainly aware there's this great controversy about GMO products right now. Okay, that's GMO is uh, uh, genetically modified organisms. Yeah, um, which is usually like corn or something like that. Yes, right? yes. Monsanto is paying for this kind of research. Yeah. Right? Frankly, when I, I go to bed at night and think dystopian, I sit there and worry that Al Qaeda gets a microbiologist working for them as opposed to a bomb maker. You know, uh, that that could be a more dangerous thing. That could be more scary. So. Uh, I don't know. That's probably a very negative thought. So I'm not even. No, right. but it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, part of our future. Yes, and, and, it is. You know, the age of in. context. Every time I give a talk about the, what's happening, people get freaked out because mm -hmm. they're being surveilled mm -hmm. and being surveilled at a level that most people are not yet aware of. Um, you know, the sensors in my phone can tell what I'm doing. I, I got mean, whether I I'm had walking the, or running. I had the disturbing uh, aspect that AT&T sent me a text saying, "Good news! The cell you are in Oakland, California, uh, just got 4G." And then about three weeks later, I got a text saying, "Good news! The cell you are near my home just got 4G." And what they were in effect doing was saying to me, "We know where you are all the time." <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I, I realized I'm not sure I would be sending those text messages if I worked for AT and T because you're just reminding me of how much you're watching me. Yeah. Where do I learn more about you and your work and uh, what you're doing at Claremont Ventures? Well, Claremont you can Creek. go to our website and and, and uh, we have descriptions of all of our companies. And uh, I, I did recently post an article about what big data means in in. Uh, in the modern world and how uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the confirmation bias concept uh, may be worried. So I, I, I am doing some publications as well, different uh, thought patterns, thought ideas that I have. So uh, 
just follow me. You can see it. Very cool. Thank you yeah. so much for coming yes. in. It was really fun. Oh, it was nice talking to you as well. And now I'm really freaked out. <laughs> and it takes a lot. You better to wash your hands. Out. You better want to wash your hands. Uh, now. <laughs> believe me, I'm a carrier, not a. It doesn't okay. affect me. Oh, God, let me go wash my hands. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.